Well, hello, chemistry students. This is Mr. Kinney. We're going to go over the second half of the review sheet for the test. This is going to be the part two, questions 16 through 30. Let me zoom out. So we're really now beginning to get into the periodic trends. And that's what makes periodic table periodic, is that there's repeating patterns that tend to happen. And just one of the coolest repeating patterns you got. I mean, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but look at that. Here is, this is the atomic radius, and you can see each of these blips here, each of these little sections represents a different period. And you can see they have a similar trend. They start high, and they get low. They start restart high again, and they get low. So the periodic table is just filled with these trends that will repeat like that based upon either the period or the group they're in. Okay, and um, over here, this is for ionization energy. But again, we see the same kind of a trend, start high, we get low, and I don't know if I have, there we go, and this one, okay, and here's electronegativity now, so this one's a little bit different with these, each of these periods, now a period is each of these little um, sections that go up, and we start low, and we end up getting high, this was for electronegativity, which is how much, how badly an, an atom wants to bond with another atom, how badly it needs to get electrons is really what bonding about other atoms is. And ionization energy, really nice graph for that one. Again, when we look at this, you see a trend starting from the beginning of a period. These elements here are all the beginning of a period. Okay, these are the alkali metals. And then they go on up to a peak at the noble gas at the end. Or they don't have a noble gas, the highest um, um, atom in their, in their period. So it's pretty cool. Now you get little blips along the way, but the trend you can see is for ionization energy, the energy it takes to pull an electron off an atom, really low on the left side of the table because they want to get rid of electrons, really high up here. But, oh, an announcement. Okay, so anyway, so we don't need to worry about that announcement. Oh, where'd it go? Here we go. Let's get started on number 15 now. So, uh, excuse me, number 16. Okay. Oh, will that person stop making the announcement, please? That was just... Hopefully Amanda finds where she needs to go. All right, what I've done on this one, I've gone through and put the page numbers in your textbooks where you can be looking. So I'd recommend you get your textbook open and you open up to that page. You want to be looking at what I'm talking about. You need to pause this video and take a look at it and read it and see the diagrams. So let's get started. Number 16, what are the trends for atomic size as you go down or across the periodic table. Well, on page 171, it's going to show you those. And I guess a picture is worth a thousand words, page 171. So as we go across the periodic table, okay, so as we go from left to right, I'm always going to go from left to right. We see that. As we go from left to right, the size is going to get smaller. So that's the periodic trend for size. They tend to get smaller because we're getting more protons and the more protons increase the positive pull of the nucleus and it makes this, it sucks the, the electrons closer to the nucleus. So, and then as we go down the periodic table, so over here, we, they tend to get bigger as we go down because we're adding, here we have like just the 1s orbital. Now we got the 2s orbital. And the 2s orbital completely surrounds what's above it. The 3s orbital completely surrounds all of those. So as we go down, we're just getting more and more shells. And eventually they just get bigger because there's just more area. So the size of the atoms get bigger. In fact, take a look at the graph. Okay, so this is our really pretty graph for that. As we go from the left side of the periodic table, this is period two, they start to get smaller. We're getting more um, neutron, we're getting more protons. Now you do get a little blip occasion, like here neon kind of goes up, but look at the trend, they get smaller. And over here, they're getting smaller. When we get over to period four, we get a little blips here and there. The transition metals kind of do that, but the overall trend is here. Over here, and when we get now, we get into the F orbitals, and there we get the overall trend, even though there's some blips, the trend is they get smaller as you go over here. Number 17, 
why does the atomic size change? Why does the atom change the way it does as you go across or down the table? Well, first off, okay, so looking at this, why do they get smaller as they go over here? More protons as you go across cause um, pulling on the electron orbitals, on the electron shell, and it pulls it closer to the, to the nucleus. So that's why this happens. More protons that pulls the shells in. And then as we go down, okay, so the reason to explain on this one, like I kind of did that before, is that as you go down, you're just getting more shells. You get more shells piled on top of each other as you go down lower on the periodic table as you go from period one through period seven you're just getting more and more shells if you could look inside of this one you'd see the 3s and the 2s and the 1s all inside of there and then actually if you could look and you'd see the p orbitals with their weird little shapes inside of each of those two number 18 what group of elements um, are the peaks for atomic size when graphed by number? Again, on page 171. So when you take a look at the graph here, so the peaks are always going to be for atomic size. It's going to be the elements in group one, which are the alkali metals. And then the second highest is going to be the alkali earth metals. And then you, then um, the, the, the valleys are always going to be, for, for these, it's going to tend to be the the noble gases. We do get a little exception there, but the trend is the noble gases are going to have the, the smallest atomic size in, in a period, and then the alkali metals are going to have the biggest. And it, here, here we got a graph there. You can see the, the different periods as we go. So the peaks for atomic size are going to be the alkali, alkali metals. And the lows will be the noble gases, as shown. Oh, I'm off the page. Sorry about that. Okay, okay number 19. Let me see if I can autofocus this a little bit. What are the trends for electronegativity as you go across or down the tables? Now, electronegativity trends. Okay, turn your book to page 177. You're going to have those trends there for you to see. And so I'm going to turn to page 177 again. Now, we don't have a nice graph in the textbook to show you, but electronegativity is the book. Well, the book says it's the combining element of an element, how, um, you know, how it can attract electrons. Well, when an element attracts electrons, it's usually attracting another element usually to, to bond with it. But when you look at this chart, we see the highest electronegativity number. I think that's an answer. It's going to be coming up in a little bit. Page 177, fluorine has the highest. Now, we don't count the noble gases. We don't put helium and, and neon and so on because they don't need to attract electrons, so we don't have it. So if they ask you a question, what's the highest peak for electronegativity, it's going to be the halogens here. Because electronegativities, they don't they don't show the they don't they don't count the noble gases, and then as we get down over here to this corner, to cesium, it's got the smallest at 0.7. Now, as we get down here, these you're getting more and more shells. They're getting bigger and bigger. Cesium has got huge 7s um, shell over here. It's and the nucleus is so far away from this electron out here, it's easy to to flick off an electron. Let me get this. There you go. So if you got this electron way far away, however, fluorine over here, it is. If I'm going to try to draw a relative to scale, I mean the the shell's really close to the nucleus. The nucleus has a lot of pull on this, and it takes a lot of energy to pull that electron away from from here. And plus, these guys don't want to lose electrons. They need more. They want one more electron. Fluorine does to become stable. So let me get back to the question. Make sure I answer the question for you. The trends for electronegativity as you go across the table, okay, as you go across, electronegativity gets bigger. So across, and again, I'm always going to go left to right, small to large. And then as you go down the table, they're going to be, I'm going to draw an arrow to represent it, large. 
too small. So since over here we have the small side going this way, let me zoom in, and we have small down here. Over here, cesium is going to have the smallest electronegativity at 0.7 we just saw, where over here, fluorine is going to have the highest at 4. Oh, and which element has the largest value? It'll be fluorine with 4. It's the upper right corner of the periodic table. Again, there you go. Picture worth a thousand words. Get your books and look at it. Oh, I guess if you'd like a graph, I think I do have a graph of electronegativity. Here we go. So electronegativity right here. And I guess really in your notes, I really should say for electronegativity, oh, fix this if you have it. Okay, yeah, there we go. We're going to cross off the note. It's the halogens. For electronegativity, the peak are going to be the halogens. Oh, I need to fix that in the notes for you, okay? So it's that. Now, if it's ionization energy, it would be noble gas, but... Number 19. Oh, I already did 19. Number 20. Let's zoom out. Let's be able to see what the question says. So why do electro... Oh, and go to page 177 if you're not already there. So why do electronegativity values change the way they do as you go across the periodic table? Well, Electronegativity values are calculated from the ionization energy, and we'll get to ionization energy later. So they're going to follow the same trend. And since you have higher ionization energies in the upper right corner of the periodic table, you're going to have higher electronegativities because electronegativity is in part calculated from ionization energy. And again, as we go, the biggest reason really comes down to this side needs electrons, the side of the periodic table. This side wants to lose electrons. So the elements over here really need to attract electrons so they have a high electronegativity. They need to attract electrons or atoms that can share electrons with them. And let's say as you go down the periodic table, the reason that electronegativity value like here is so small, 0.7, and I think at the top of that group, let me look here, like um, lithium and hydrogen, they're like 2.1 and then like 1. So because you're getting really big, these electrons in the outer shell are really far away. Hydrogen's fairly small. They're so far away from the nucleus, um, they, they don't need electrons, and they're so far away, it's easy to just throw them off. It doesn't take hardly any energy at all to kick off those electrons. Number 21, so you need to be on page 177. There's a chart. What group of elements peaks for electronegativity? Okay, so that's a real good one. The peaks for electronegativity are going to be the halogens. Again, electronegativity, the noble gases, they don't need to attract electrons. Let me zoom in here. So when we graph all of these, there should be... If it's graphed, there should be a little skip in there because there should be a spot where they're not graphing the, the, um, the noble gas. Noble gases don't attract them. Halogens are going to be the peaks for electronegativity. And let's see. What, oh, what group are the low? Oh, we'll be back out so we can see. So number 21 still. What group are the lows? Okay, and then this is question number 21 still. And the lows are going to be the alkali metals. Okay, so these right here, those are the alkali metals. They want to get rid of electrons. They don't want to share electrons. They just get rid of them. So the alkali metals will always be low, whether it's electronegativity or ionization energy. Number 22, what group of elements, turn to page, we're still on page 177, what group of elements are not included in the graph of electronegativity? Okay, so we don't include the noble gases. And the reason why we don't have it, um, noble gases do not need more electrons. 
they're stable. They have all the electrons they need. They have eight electrons except for helium. It only has two, but that's all it needs. They do not need more electrons. That's why the noble gases are not on there. Number 23, what are the trends for ionization energy as you go across or down the table? Well, you need to go to page 173 in your textbook. It'll show that. It's got a really nice graph on there. 173, it'll give you the definitions for it. There you go. See, definitions on the page 173. And we got this great graph right here that shows you ionization energy. Now, an ion is an atom that has had an electron pulled off, or it's gained an electron. And so ionization energy is going to be how much energy it takes to pull another electron off of these. And what happens is on up here as we get over to, we start off really low, um, so lithium on the left side of the table, it, it wants to get rid of electrons. It doesn't take much energy, only 500 kilojoules per mole of, of, of energy. But you get up higher, and it's kind of cool. You get these little blips in here. More or less, this is where it's kind of cool. Every time on the periodic table where we have these little drop-offs or step-ups, you're going to get a little blip right there, okay? So that's kind of neat, kind of more or less. Oh, let me make sure I'm answering the question here. What are the trends for ionization energy? Okay, so the trend is, as you're going across the table, the trend is they get higher, with the noble gases being the highest. I mean, you can pull an electron. You can try to ionize a, a neon, which is a noble gas, but it's going to take a lot of energy, 1,200 kilojoules per mole. That's a lot. Where the, the metals, they're like, oh, come on, 500 to 1,000. That's pretty easy by comparison. This is really hard to do. Over there. It's not impossible, but it's hard. So, let's see. Did we answer that? What are the trends as you go across the table? Okay, as you go across the table, ionization energy, they get, they go from low to high. It's really hard to pull electrons over here. It takes a lot of energy. High energy, a lot of joules. As you go down the table, okay, so as you go down the table, it's going to be the same as, as it was going to be really low over here. So it increases this way as you go up. This is really low. Okay, and hopefully, uh, I guess you can't see that. I gotta remember you're gonna be looking on a computer screen. So um, the trends are really high over here, really low over there, just like it was for electronegativity, because electronegativity is based upon ionization energy. It takes almost no energy to flick an electron off this huge atom here. Takes a little bit less, it takes a little more energy to flick an uh, um, electron from the outer shell here. And over here, these are so small, so close to the nucleus, it takes a lot of energy to pull one off. What element has the lowest value? Well, that's gonna be cesium. When you look at the electronegativity chart, it's the, uh, francium is the bottom of the chart, but it doesn't exist for more than a fraction of a second. So cesium has the smallest, C, uh, um, capital C, lowercase s, the lowest electronegativity. It has the lowest ability to attract an electron. It's trying to spit them out. And that was cesium. You can look it up yourself. Page 174, what group of elements are the peak for ionization energy? Well, beautiful graph. Again, that's going to be the peaks for ionization energy are going to be the noble gases. It takes a lot of energy and the, the low points are going to be the, the alkaline metals. So the peaks, noble gas. What are the group lows? It's going to be alkaline metals. Oh, my pen's running out on me. So you can see, there we go. And that was question 24. Question 25, again on page 174, why do ionization energy values change the way they do as you go across or down? So why is it? Now this is the second part of there. Why do they do that? And again, the best way I can do that, if we draw the periodic table, elements on this side, they need electrons. And these guys over here, they want to lose electrons. And they hold on to them close. Plus, this side of the table, they tend to be, the atoms tend to be smaller. 
So there's smaller atoms size. So there's more pull from the nucleus. The plus charges in here as we get over, we get more atomic atomic number increases. We get more protons pulling. So it's not only do these guys want to hold on to them anyway, they need the electrons to become stable, but the atoms get smaller as we get over here. They're closer to the nucleus, so it's harder. It takes more energy to pull that little electron off because it's closer to the nucleus and the positive charges that are trying to attract it in. And then again, as you go down the periodic table, okay, atoms get physically bigger as you get down the table. And now these atoms are so far away even over here, I mean, these guys, okay, they're getting further away from the um, nucleus. It's easier to pull them off. These guys over here, really huge, huge shells. They're so far away from that little nucleus, it's easy to flick off that electron. They have really low electronegativities, plus they want to get rid of them anyway. For the next question, you need to be on page 172 for number 26, page 172. And we're going to be answering here. So what are ions? So ions are when atoms gain or lose electrons. And the diagram I did here, so when an atom gains electrons, that would be the nonmetals, or loses electrons to become stable. Which means to have their outer shell have eight electrons to become stable. So, what gains? Nonmetals tend to gain these. Like the halogens, they really want one electron. And the loses, the metals. The metals want to lose electrons. They give electrons away because then they become stable. So that's what ions are. So the example in class we did today, we said if you take lithium and you remove an electron from it, you pull an electron off, it will become a positive lithium ion. That means it's got, still has three protons, but only two electrons. And now it's, it's stable, but it's got a charge. And that's what an ion is. Or it could be the other side if fluorine adds an electron, the electron that lithium throws off will change it into fluorine with a negative charge. That means fluorine now has 10 electrons total, but it still only has nine protons, so it's got a negative charge. It's stable, it's happy, but it's, the payoff is this negative charge will attract it to positive charges of other ions. And how do it, um, sizes of uh, ions compare whether they're positive or negative. Well, what happens is fluorine, it's going to get a little bit bigger. Fluorine is getting another electron. So if I were to draw a little diagram, if fluorine started off, fluorine atom started off this big, when it adds that one electron to ionize, it's going to be, and I'm going to exaggerate a little bit, it's going to be a little bit bigger. It's got an extra electron. Still the same number of protons trying to pull it in, but it's get a little bit bigger. Now, for lithium, it's a little bit, it's just the opposite. If lithium starts off this big, well, when it loses that electron, when it throws an electron off, it's throwing off its, its, its 2s electron, it, its 2s shell, it's going to get a little bit smaller. It doesn't have as much. So metals tend to get smaller when they ionize. Nonmetals tend to get a little bit bigger. But the trend still stays the same. As you go across the periodic table, they tend to get overall smaller, but nonmetals get slightly bigger when they ionize. Metals get slightly, excuse me, nonmetals get slightly larger when they ionize. Nonmetals get slightly smaller. Okay, this is going long. I didn't want this to be that long. What are the number of electron shells? How are they determined? By the group number. Look on the periodic table by the group number. Whatever group you are in, that is how many. Um, that's the valence electrons you're going to have. That rule doesn't follow for these. So group one, group two, okay, that's how many valence electrons they have, electrons in the outer shell. That's how you tell. This is over here like this is group uh, 14. 
there's four electrons in the outer. Oh, let me zoom out so we can see that. There we go. Sorry. These guys have one electron in their shell, two electrons in their shell, 14. Well, 14 is the group number, but there's four electrons in their outer shell. That's just the easiest way to get that one. How many electron shells do neon and nitrogen have? Well, nitrogen, okay, neon first is in group 18. So it has, um, and the question is, okay, and okay, sorry about that. How many electron shells? Okay, so neon is in period two. And whatever period you're on, that's how many shells you have. So neon is in period two, it has two shells. And nitrogen is also in period two. It has two shells as well. What are the what are valence electrons? We well, got to go to page 187, and it's going to tell you it's how many electrons you have in your outer shell. So page 187, it's um, number of electrons in outermost shell. Okay, and you can look on the periodic table. If you're in group 14, you have four electrons in your outer shell. If you're in group 15, you're going to have five electrons. Group 15, right? Five electrons in the outer shell. How many valence electrons do aluminum and bromine have? Well, here's aluminum. It's in group 13, so aluminum has three electrons in its outer shell. Three valence electrons. And what was the other one? I have no memory of that. Bromine. There's bromine. It's in group 17. It's part of the halogens. It has seven electrons in its outer shell. Three and seven, because we just look to see what group number they're in. And if it's a teen number, like 13 and 17, we just take the last number. Okay, what is electron configuration? Well, electron configuration is a way to show how many electrons in each suborbital because we have shells and we learned that shells are made up of most of them of suborbitals okay what is represented by this well what this tells us is first off we have our first shell and our second shell and here's the third shell as we've learned them up to here and the first shell has what we said it's it can hold this suborbital can hold two electrons, so we've got one and two, and we call that the 1s2. And then the next one over here, that we have the 2s, so we're gonna have one electron and then two. Now the p electrons, they're like a suite of three rooms. And each of those rooms can have two electrons, so first we gotta put one, one, and one, and then we'll finish it up with its neighbor and so that's going to be the 2p6. And then we're going to get it another, as we start the next energy level, we've got the 3p. We've got two electrons in there. Let me separate those. Okay, so we got two electrons there. Then we're going to begin to fill. And now in this one, here's our three suite room, but it only has one electron like that. And when we add these up, 2, 4, plus 6 is 10, 11, 12, 13. We have 13 total electrons. That'll be aluminum. What are the rules for filling orbitals? Okay, you always start lowest energy level first. Fills up, and that's going to be the 1s orbital. And then we'll begin the 2s orbital. And that's where we've got those various sheets to help you remember that on there. And then let's see, oh, the next rule on it is that uh, each suborbital has two electrons. Each suborbital up to two electrons. Now that's where like we say, okay, we've been calling our analogy a room. They can have up to two electrons in each of those. If they're like the, um, the P block, they're gonna have a suite of three rooms, each of those with two, okay, but still each of those can have two. And lastly, when we get into the rooms where we have the suite, whether it's like the, um, the P orbitals or the D orbitals or a suite of five rooms when we get to those, those are the D orbitals. The rule is each room has to get, each suborbital has to have an electron 
before you can get it a roommate, before it can get a paired spin. So each suborbital needs one electron and each before it gets a paired electron. Because electron scientists found out they want to have a partner to spin, you know, like this one electron will spin this way, this electron will spin the other way. So over here in the d orbitals, you have to fill those up. First, you got to put one electron in each of those rooms. Then if you get a six electron now, you can, that one can have a roommate. And then lastly, it says draw the electron configurations using arrows for phosphorus and iron. Okay, well, I went through, got this set up. When we go through and work these out, we find that phosphorus has this electron configuration. And as we go through, there's the two and the one s. And here's the 2s orbital. Here's the 2p orbital with its 6. And again, when we started filling those in, they filled in like this. And then they came back and they started to fill in that way. Then this orbital filled up. This is the lowest energy level. We're going to higher. And then finally over here, the 3p, it has to have, it has to get an electron in each room before it, it can't just put like two together here and one there. They have to each have one in there. And then over here, here's iron. Okay, so the electron configuration for iron would be like this. Now, when we fill these out, you got to, there's a couple ways. Now, what we find out is that after the, the, the 3p orbital fills up, the 4s actually fills up first, it's lower energy level. But when we draw these out sometimes in this format, they'll keep all of the three together. So even though as, as they're filling in, this will be the first, then the second, then the third, then the fourth, then the fifth, then this will be the sixth subshell to fill, and then this one. Don't let that get you distracted. When we're using this format, where we're putting them together like this, we need to, okay, we know that that'll fill up first. That's why this has two, then it'll come back here. This is actually the higher energy level than this, but sometimes we get them put together like this. We'll put all the, th the, the 3D, 3P, and 3, 6 together and just kind of know that one goes first. All right, we're done. Thank goodness. 32 minutes. Yikes. Oh.